you know, like I came to sing the world back into love and I came to help people remember like what love feels like through vibration, through the genuine vibration of what comes through me that is me and also transcends me because there are energies that are coming through that I honestly can't take credit for. <laughs> you know, there's the, the, the blessing of being able to be the conduit of what is me and also transcends me. And I really believe that a massive part of my dharma is to turn as many people on to sound as a technology and the healing capacity of sound. Like I started doing sound healing because nothing I was doing was working to heal myself. Now the, the, the plethora of plant medicines and ceremonies that I was doing with psychedelics, like the dark night that I was going through in my life, nothing was working. Bye, Lana Marcus. Welcome <laughs> on Just Tap In. What are you most excited about right now in your life? Oh my gosh. Wow. What am I the most excited about in my life? That's going to take me a second to kind of listen to try to distill. I feel like when you when you ask that question, my whole brain was like, ha, 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 ha. <laughs> so kind of coming back to just a place of listening into what feels like the appropriate answer to that beautiful and broad question. Mm, the thing that I'm most excited about in life right now is what is opening in my voice. And so, you know, we had the beautiful pleasure of meeting on a trip with the most epic humans of all time in Egypt. And, you know, part of the way that we connected was I got to sing when we were there. And, and part of what I do is um, I'm a sound alchemist <clears throat> that is just, it's very early here. So excuse my throat chakra not totally being awake um, it's just open up again <laughs> it's <today. laughs> just starting i'm like oh more water and i'm also in sedona which is quite dry um but i'm a sound alchemist i'm a sound healer and i use sound to help you know really bring like a resonance to people's energy field and it's part of what i was created to do it's the thing that i'm always the most excited about because for me it is my direct connection to the divine. And so, um, you know, the eclipse happened in totality in Austin, Texas, where my, where my home is. And I got to be part of this whole unbelievable sacred ritual with some of our brothers and sisters that were on our Egypt trip. And a lot of what that eclipse energy was about was places in my throat chakra that weren't, weren't fully activated and that were a little bit, you know, we're a little bit repressed and, and not fully, not fully open and not fully expressed. And so what I'm most excited about in a very long winded answer is, you know, for whatever reason, after the eclipse and whatever that energetic alignment created for me and my soul and my vibration and my throat, you know, my throat chakra has been opening up into these places that I have never been able to access before. And so what I'm most excited about is just singing. Um, you know, I have a series that you've been so wonderful to be tuning into called, uh, there's actually two series called I Am Unique Sound that comes out on the full moons. And We Are Unique Sound that comes out on the new moons. And, you know, in these episodes, it's, it's, it's sort of like what we're doing right now. I'm tuning into a specific person and I'm singing their soul song as, you know, like a channeled transmission of their unique vibration. And so, you know, post eclipse, I've done three episodes. One of them is going to be Matthias, which is going to release on the solstice. That's going to be mind blowing. On the, on the June solstice. <laughs> And they have just, I mean, I'm, you know, I've been a singer my whole life. I've been doing sound healing for the past, like, uh, how many years now? Five, six years, maybe. But I've been a singer my whole life. And so to feel the evolution of what is happening continuously in my voice 
as I, you know, stay on this path of just really using my, my voice as a healing modality to help awaken people into a, you know, greater awareness and remembrance of their unique self. Um, yeah, my voice, <laughs> it's like a super long winded early morning answer of my voice and, and how I'm using my voice is, is the thing that I'm definitely the most excited about because it sort of spans, you know, using my voice for healing and activating and, you know, bringing about more resonance, remembrance and awakening within people. So it's like using it as a healing instrument. And then simultaneously, I've also been getting back into, you know, music with English lyrics and working, collaborating with other artists and kind of getting back into a little bit more of my artist spirit in that way. And, and it's just been everything I've been focused on recently is just all I want to do is sing. <laughs> mm -hmm. The synchronicity behind the sequence of these episodes, it's, it's always impeccable because it almost seems like I'll record an episode with a guest, then the next one I'll record, it like ties in in a very interesting way. Mm. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit how yours is tying in right now for me because just last week um, we did an episode with Kaya Ra, the author oh, of The wow. Sophia Code. I know her. And... <laughs> And I know, you know, I know her, her book changed, <laughs> changed a lot in your life Sorry. and you still feel the magic weaving in, its, in your life. And, you know, as you were mentioning the voice, she has a whole activation on Hathor in this book. And Hathor is deeply connected with, with, with the throat chakra, the sound, the vibration, the soul essence. And you actually trained with this man, Dr. Hubbard, where he was getting channeled from Hathor into this like multi-dimensional layer of sound totally and i'm really curious to know from us being in egypt together and you being very connected with the lineage of these like ancient goddesses and ascended masters how have you connected with for example hathor mm -hmm. in your journey to activate now it seems like it's something very multi-layered multi-dimensional within your own being totally yeah, so so as you mentioned, so um, I was not always a sound healer. I was actually trying to be a pop star uh, in my earlier and mid twenties. Um, you know, stepped away from from that. It was as I kind of went on my spiritual path, and you know, in twenty nineteen, as I was going through a very difficult time in my life, I found sound healing, and you know, was went into like a whole retreat teaching of this particular modality called holographic sound healing that was taught to me by my teacher, Dr. Paul Hubbard, who actually channeled this particular modality from the Hathors. And so Hathor existed in ancient Egypt and they were, you know, it actually was like, like predated Isis. And so like the temple of Dendera was the temple to Hathor and she was the goddess of sound and beauty and dance. And it was like everything, you know, wonderful that there is about life. It was Hathor, but the Hathors were known for the way that they used sound as a healing modality and a healing instrument. And so much of ancient Egypt, you know, as we went and experienced, like so many of the temples are sound chambers because they understood the power of sound as a technology that is far beyond what we could even, I think we're beginning to, Science is beginning to put data to what is happening with sound, but because our belief field of only being able to measure, you know, like our belief field is limited by the way that we just look at scientific data, which is the tangible of what we can see in those ancient times. And this is something that, you know, Matthias has sort of taught me along the way. They were actually like measuring the relationship between things. So instead of, you know, measuring the data of what we can see, they they were measuring alchemy, they were doing alchemy, they were measuring the relationship between things. And so a lot of how sound worked about back in those ancient times was in these more like magical mystical ways that their belief field was so expanded they would sing to they would sing and become the vibration of the stones to be able to like pick up and move the stones and and all of these all of these things I'm quoting Matthias so I'm not going to act like I was there and I know what I'm talking about but I deeply feel you know the truth in in my being of understanding you know the power of sound is a technology that is so far beyond what we know 
right now. And so, you know, to more clearly answer your question with Hathor, you know, my initial introduction to Hathor was actually in the Sophia Code. So I'm sure people, you know, will have probably already listened to that episode, but in this book, you know, this was a massive part of my spiritual awakening. And, you know, she has these channeled stories of different divine feminine ascended masters. Um, and each of them get to tell their story from their perspective. And then she guides you through this like beautiful ritual where you are invoking and activating their particular, you know, unique codes into your own being, you know, through your own spiritual practice through your own ceremony that doesn't include medicine, you know, and, and it's absolutely beautiful. I would highly recommend it to anyone. It was a really, really big aspect of my um, coming into my spiritual path. And so my first introduction to Hathor was through that book. And when I did that particular, um, you know, it's like a DNA activation. There was a lot of things that started opening for me just in my life at large. And started noticing a lot of synchronicities and eventually found my way to, you know, discovering my teacher who channeled holographic sound healing from the Hathors. And so, you know, I go into this sound healing um, certification, just really interested, intrigued, and actually kind of a little bit desperate because I was at a very difficult place in my life at the time and didn't really know what to expect going into it. And, you know, when we when we started this program, the way that he described this particular modality is that it's using sound in a multidimensional sense to create greater resonance in your energy field through the body, but it's across all timelines of your being. And so the way that I'm going into doing a sound healing with this particular structure, I am setting up energy structures, you know, specific types of intentions, working with this whole modality, which is, you know, it's hard to even describe and I'm not going to try to because that is not my work to do to teach his teachings. Um, but it's ultimately working through the entire chakra system. So it's going, you know, from the root to the sacral to the solar plexus and it's going and it's, it's literally like kind of almost like with like surgical precision bringing anywhere where there is dissonance in the energy field back into resonance. So if you can imagine in any kind of instrument, say a piano, for instance, when you're playing the keys, you can hear when a key is dissonant because it's not, you know, like it's not like a full note or a half note up. There's like something about it that doesn't quite feel right or resonant. And once there are dissonant keys, it starts to impact the vibration of everything around it. So if you imagine your entire body and your entire energy field as vibration and wherever you have any illnesses, repressed emotions, trauma in the nervous system, you know, all of these sort of um, ailments that we can have in the body, those are like dissonant keys in the piano. And so what sound healing is working to do is it's working to through the, you know, law of resonance. If you've ever seen those, um, I actually just saw on Instagram like yesterday. Have you ever seen those um, experiments where they'll play a crystal bowl that's like a certain frequency? So say it's a, a, a C note and it's 444 hertz, 444 hertz. The hertz is the how many revolutions per second, you know, it's oscillating. So if, if you hit a bowl that's 444 hertz and it's a C and there's a bowl next to it that's the exact same hertz, the other bowl without even playing it will start singing. It'll start vibrating. Oh, It'll wow. start moving. And, the, and they do this. They do They're this like ex- quantum entangled. I mean, way. it's, yeah, it's like the, it's like the, the, everything wants to resonate in the same vibration. And if it's the same resonant frequency, it could actually activate the vibration of another bowl. So same thing with tuning forks. There's this experiment I just saw on, on Instagram, which I love that something like this is happening on Instagram, but they had two tuning forks like side by side. One of them had like a ping pong ball next to it or some kind of ball attached to something. And so they had a 440 tuning fork on this side. And then on this side, they tried to play one that was like 520 or something like that and nothing happens. But then they bring a different one and it's 440 and he bangs this one and the ball starts moving because this one starts vibrating. So it's like through... Through the law of resonance, which is like 
scientifically proven, like you can see these experience, uh, these um, experiments in, if you just literally look on Google, through the law of resonance, your energy field wants to resonate with the crystalline structures and frequencies that are happening through crystal bowls, you know, through Tibetan bowls, and even through people's voices. And when you're setting the intentions for there to be healing activation in the DNA, you know, whatever it may be that you are intending for, you know, sound can actually work in this way that is like, again, so far beyond what we can see. I mean, the things that I have seen, and I know I'm going on like a super long rant, but I'm very passionate about no, sound. No, keep going. <laughs> so the thing, some of the things that I have seen, I, I mean, I've facilitated for and sang for thousands of people at this point in big groups as individuals, you know, and, and every single time it is a completely unique translate uh, transmission that is nothing like any other one that I've ever done. So every single one of them is, is entirely unique because I'm listening to the field. And so I have seen things like, I'll give you a couple examples just of the ones that stick out the most that I love talking about because it's really exciting. So back when I, this, and this was a long time ago, back around, I'd probably only been doing sound healing for like a year. And um, some friends of mine had a, uh, a friend of theirs that had a stroke when he was like 21 and he couldn't remember any of his childhood, like nothing, no memories from no recollection. And he was in his fifties. And so they wanted for me to do a sound healing for him and just see if, you know, something could sort of open or activate and just see what would happen. And so we go and do a sound healing and, you know, and, and there was also like a, a psychedelic assisted psychotherapy situation happening. So I'm not going to take like full credit, but, but also literally from that day, he started having memories of his childhood and has, has since, you know, it's been probably wow. three years since we did that. And since has still had memories of his childhood. I just got to connect with him like a couple months ago and he thanked me again, just for, you know, living literally 30 something years of his life, never being able to remember anything that happened to him as a kid and being able to like, you know, have these memories just coming in over and over and over, like, the, you know, bringing in all the missing puzzle pieces from what he couldn't see from when he was a child. Um, you know, wow. my, my husband had an ulcer at one, like physical, physical ulcer that was happening that like, you know, just went in, did some sound, was like hyper-focused, worked with, you know, holographic sound healing in that particular modality. And literally within 20 minutes, of, and I also do energy work, so it wasn't just the sound, but like after 20 minutes of working on him, like, and, and ulcers are super, super painful, like the ulcer went away. So there's been like interesting biological things that have happened. There's been people who have come to me who had like such intense social anxiety. They just, they couldn't even talk to people in public. And after doing a couple sessions without any medicine or energy work, um, signed up for a men's group and felt like comfortable enough to just like start to try to kind of get out there. And, you know, so it's like, I mean, the, the, the possibilities are so vast and on the most basic minimal level, if you listen to a sound healing, there are guaranteed biological things that are going to happen if you can really like slow down and receive. And, you know, it's going to bring your brain waves down into deeper states. It's going to, you know, relax your nervous system. It's going to shift your breathing. Like there's different things that happen in the body of just being able to really like tune in and relax and slow down for a moment. And then there are things that are super mystical that can happen that like, I won't get into, you know, more stories because I'd love for you to speak, but it's just like the things that I have seen sound do, I don't, I don't think that we even have like, like even like a, the, like a pinky nail worth of understanding of sound as a technology. And so it's a really exciting field to be in this wave of, um, and it's the thing that I love to do the most. So, um, <laughs> I went really off there, but the connect to kind of circle back the connection to, I would like to tell a story since you asked me about Hathor. So hmm. my very first trip to Egypt was back in May of last year. So about a year ago and a year ago, yeah. my very first, very first time in Egypt. And, 
um, went to the Temple of Dendetta, um, which is the Temple of Hathor. And, you know, the group that I went with was really amazing. And um, I was able to bring like my bowls in some of the temples. And, and, and that's not a very usual thing, but for whatever reason, we were able to do that. And so um, one of the people that were in charge of the trip was like, oh, you should go into the Holy of Holies you know, which you actually have to climb up this ladder and it's this very small, um, small little space. And so I get up there, I have my Tibetan bowl. Oop, kitty, no. Sorry, my cat's trying to knock over my laptop. Come here, come here, over here. Um, wants to make an appearance. She wants to make an appearance. <laughs> come on, come say hello to everyone. Hi, baby, come here. Okay, sorry. It's very impossible to never have interruptions from cats. This is me, Teary. Hey, hi, Dido Beautiful Dido. cat, beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> um, so go up into the Holy of Holies, which is actually you have to climb up this ladder. And when I get up in there, Matthias De Stefano is in there channeling and this other woman, Happy Hoffman and, um, and another sister and her daughter. And so I just start singing, which is what I always do. I'm just sort of like, you know, tuning into the energy, really listening. Cause a lot of what happens in Egypt is the stones are the vibration of what was happening there. So a lot of people go to Egypt and it's like beautiful and they probably have very magical and mystical experiences because it's so activating, but also like sort of a really important code to understand is the vibration in the stones is actually what is like emanating the information of how you can really tap into Egypt. And I learned that really early on in the temple of Isis when I was with Matthias, but it was like, if you can really slow down and get quiet and listen to the stones and start toning and creating sound, the sound waves creates this like relationship that happens with the stones that, you know, really feels like it can open portals and do wild things. The resonance. The resonance. Yeah, the resonance. Yeah, totally. And so we're in the Holy of Holies in the Temple of Dendera. I am playing my Tibetan bowl and I just start singing. And this woman who I just met, her name is Happy Hoffman, and we're actually doing music together now, but she starts singing with me in perfect harmony and singing the words that I'm singing. And you know, you've heard me sing before when I'm singing yeah. and I'm channeling, it's not in English language. You know, it's, 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 it's all frequency, they're shapes and they're creating, you know, the sacred geometry, but it's not like a language that's, you know, part of the human mind or understanding. So I'm, and they're always different. Like I have no idea what it's like. It trespasses to. the conscious brain and it starts totally. hitting another aspect of you. Totally. It helps you, it, it bypasses the mind's need to understand what's happening. Because if I were to say to you, you know, love is beautiful. Your mind's already processing what I said. So you're experiencing the vibration of what I said, but your mind, it, it also is going to this specific part of your brain where you're like understanding, like it has meaning and then you're making meaning out of that meaning and stories and connecting it to memories. And there's all these like processes that are happening with sound healing when I'm singing and it's just a transmission, it bypasses the mind's need to understand. So instead you just have a visceral knowing of this familiarity of almost like being held by this very ancient thing that you feel like you understand, but it's not from here. It's from here and it's on a soul level. And so the way that the sound can penetrate you because of that, in my opinion, in the way that it has worked for me, you know, for doing sound healing for, you know, thousands of people, it helps to get to a place where, um, it just goes a little bit deeper than if I were singing things that people could understand and make meaning out of. So thank you for that distinction because it's super important. So anyway, so back to the story. So I'm singing and, you know, as I sing, they're just, they're sounds and shapes and it's not any kind of language that I'm remembering from a past life, or maybe it's from another emanation of my soul. Who knows? There's no, there's no, you know, transmission to English trans to translation that's happening. And so I'm singing and this woman, Happy Hoffman, is singing with me in perfect harmony, without delay, and she's singing the same words. So with shapes, whatever you want to call it, language, what, you know, seeds, so whatever you want to call it. Um, and so I'm like, wow, she's really great at mouth reading and like following. And so we're singing for probably like five minutes 
And finally, I open my eyes and her eyes are closed. So we're channeling the exact same song in perfect harmony, like without any kind of delay. She's not like waiting for the next note and then following me and kind of like, you know, she's singing it exactly when I'm singing it. And so in the temple of Hathor, there was this huge memory, you know, of doing, you know, having done this in past lives and having done this in past lives with this particular woman who, you know, we're in this beautiful ideation of how we're going to, you know, create together in the world because it's really, really special and really extraordinary. But with Hathor, everything is about sound. And it's not about, you know, it's not about being the greatest singer. It's about how deeply can you listen and how deeply can you listen to, you know, the frequencies that somebody else may be singing. And then when you're intuitively toning to add to what you're listening to and also creating this like symphony of voices that are happening all simultaneously, like Hathor's medicine is the multidimensionality of sound, in my opinion, mm. and in the way that I've experienced it. And so it has actually, you know, working with the particular modality, again, it's called holographic sound healing. It feels like it has opened up the multidimensionality of my voice, where sometimes I literally feel like I have extra vocal cords. And sometimes there are things that come through that I'm like, what was that? Like, you know, like there, there's no part of me that's thinking, oh, sing this melody or do it this way. It's like, no, it's just ch channeled exactly in the moment. I, I don't even know what's going to happen, but I trust so deeply that whatever's going to happen is going to be the thing that is, you know, the most um, needed and of the highest good. And so there's no space that's happening. And it's just like, I mean, some of the things that come through have surgical precision. Some of the things mm. that come through will be so unexpected that it actually like breaks somebody's feeling of knowing where something is going to go. So like, for example, in like Western music, we hear, we, we're, we kind of almost can anticipate like a melody that will happen. And then once we catch the melody, then we like really know it. And it's, it's easy to kind of anticipate where music is going to go. I've done sound healings where it's like, you feel like a melody is going to go somewhere and it goes somewhere so different than what you think. It's almost stressful because it's like, it's actually inviting you to surrender into the unknown instead of what you know. You know what I mean? So it's just like the crazy things that happen with sound. I mean, I could go on and on and I will let you speak. I apologize. But it's just, there's, there's, there's so much to it. And Again, I really, really deeply believe that we're only beginning to understand it as a technology. And, and I can't remember who the, the – it was a man that said um, the future of medicine is sound. And I deeply, deeply believe that, you know. Um, yeah. So I would love for you to <laughs> speak and ask questions before I keep blabbing on forever. <laughs> I mean, even our friend, that's beautiful what you, what you just shared because – you know, I've been exposed to sound healing a lot in my early life because my mom is also a sound healer. She uses uh, the gong, which is yeah. a whole different technology. Um, and, you know, you mix in the voice with that. And it's like we are the instrument for the divine. You mm -hmm. had a profound realization that that is that we're all unique vibration from the one original emanation. Mm -hmm. And I'm really curious to know because right now it almost seems like with that experience where you were singing with your friend and you're accessing the same note and we talked about the law of resonance but we talked about it in the in the sense of you know the the two crystal bowls resonating with each other but what happens and and what can happen to a whole global community a species when they're all resonating in coherence with that one emanation where do you see the future going if totally. we can tap into that and more people can even access that within themselves as well. Yeah, totally. I mean, when there is something extraordinary about being in a resonant field. So like if you imagine those, you know, beautiful, there's a, I think the organization is called Unify, 
where they'll get like thousands of people from across the world that'll be meditating at the same time with a common intention or, you know, oming at the same time. Like how many times have you been in a yoga class or after a breath work ceremony or, you know, whatever kind of spiritual in, coming in together. In the king's chamber, maybe. In the king's <laughs> chamber, totally. And you just, everyone ohms, right? Say you ohm three times. The first ohm, everyone's kind of like, all, you know, like they're kind of all over the place. The all second the one, place, yeah. people are starting to find that balance of where things become more harmonic. By the third one, everyone is riding this wave where they're like, they're, they're, they've fully listened to the field. They fully listen to the voices around them and they're creating these harmonics that are like, like, why is that happening? Because our bodies, our vibration desires for there to be harmony. And when there's something that's dissonant, you know, like if you're in a field of people singing and somebody just wants to have their Mariah Carey moment and totally just go off and like just do their own thing that's their own, you know, it, it, there isn't like a, and, and not that that's a bad thing, like bless people who want to have their like moment and what that can really open and activate in yourself. And simultaneously, if you're in a field where people are all trying to like sing and be in the same field together and somebody kind of just starts doing their own thing and it's dissonant with the harmonics of where everyone is at. Like there's like a palpable energy that you can feel in your body where all of a sudden everyone's attention goes to those notes that are dissonant because it's like there's this desire for there to be this unification and this harmony that kind of comes together. And it, it's actually interesting that you ask about the future because I really, I feel like a massive part of my dharma is like one from sort of like a meta perspective when I've really tuned into like, what am I here to do? Like, what is my purpose? What was I created for? And I think that there, I think it's very vast what I will do by the time, you know, I take my last breath, but also from a meta perspective, I came to sing the world back into love ultimately. And so whether that be through, you know, sound healing or whatever kinds of music with lyrics or whatever kinds of people that I collaborate with or, you know, whatever I do in private even, you know, like I came to sing the world back into love and I came to help people remember like what love feels like through vibration. And, you know, for that love to come through my voice, through, you know, for, through the genuine vibration of what comes through me that is me and also transcends me because there are energies that are coming through that I honestly can't take credit for, <laughs> you know, mm. just the, the, the blessing of being able to be the conduit of what is me and also transcends me. And I really believe that like a massive part of my dharma is to turn as many people on to sound as a technology and the healing capacity of sound, whether that be through, you know, activating the throat chakra and using your voice simply for your own healing. That was how it started for me. Like I started doing sound healing because nothing I was doing was working to heal myself. No, like the, the plethora of plant medicines and ceremonies that I was doing with psychedelics, like the dark night that I was going through in my life, nothing was working. And that was the time that I took my sound healing certification because I wanted to heal my heart with my own voice. I wanted to heal my heart with the thing that I've always loved to do most, which was sing. And so I didn't take the certification with the intention actually of singing for anyone else. I actually did it because I needed to heal myself. And because the healing result was so profound, I was like, wow, I actually need to use my voice for healing as many people as I possibly can. And so that is my desire, you know, my entire series that, um, you know, we film all the time and we're putting out all these really beautiful episodes that align with the full moons and equinoxes and new moons and solar eclipses and just like significant moments in our cosmos um you know i'm i'm doing that just because i want the most people to be able to access sound as possible and i think the more you know 
Like there's no competitive, like I want to be the one person. It's like everyone has a voice that can be used for healing. Everyone has two hands that can learn how to play crystal balls that you can play for your children when they're feeling like frustrated and they don't know what to do. And it's like if you've ever watched a baby and you play a Tibetan bowl or a crystal bowl with a baby, I do it for my nephew all the time. It's unbelievable the way that they respond because their brains aren't understanding, you know, language and they're just observing everything, but they can feel sound. The ears are the first, the first sense that a baby develops in the womb is their hearing, right? So if you even, if you even imagine when a baby is in the womb <clears throat> and you play a sound healing for them, vibration conducts through water. I don't remember what the percentage is, but our body is basically, you know, 70% or something of water. And when a baby is in the womb, they're literally floating in water and vibration. So they, you know, they've done studies of playing classical music and all these different things to see how that actually impacts a baby when they're in the womb. But like one of my favorite things to do is to do sound healing for pregnant women. Like I, I absolutely, because that connection of you being able to be in the same field as your child while they're in water. And to feel like like the babies respond too. Like my nephew, when I did sound healings for my sister when he was in the womb, he would react to Koshi chimes and to my crystal harp like so aggressively. So when he was just born, I played those for him when he came out and he was so peaceful and chill and not crying and just like, you know, it, 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 babies and children are even really highly receptive to sound. And they don't need to understand. I've done full sound healings for families and the children are like, they're so curious about what's happening and they'll kind of close their eyes for a little bit and then they'll open their eyes and watch. But it's like, it's this universal language that does not require for you to understand, right? If I listen to music that there's a epic man from Africa singing and I don't know any of what he is saying, but I feel it, right? When I, when I say, even though, you know, I speak English, but if I hear the word amor, like that makes me feel something, right? So it's like, if we can understand that like sound and vibration is a universal language that is not owned by any culture or nation. I, I mean, it's literally the universal thing that connects all of us already. And so what do I see as the future of sound? I do see, you know, one of my biggest visions that I'll just claim on this podcast because I think it's important is like getting massive amounts of people together to go through these sound activations. Because when we're all in the same field, like Matias De Stefano says this, like if you want to manifest something and you have three people the power of that manifestation with whatever prayers and intentions and you know rituals or offerings that you're doing like it is magnified when you have three or more people there's a reason why where when matthias is going all over the planet to do these activations whether they be in egypt or argentina or in the grand canyon or wherever he's called to go he's always going you know he's like doing acupuncture all over the world to help the planet release these points of tension but everywhere he goes, he gathers people. You know, the event that I went of his in Argentina for 11-11 a couple of years ago, there was 2,000 people there. And 2,000 mm. people were singing and toning and swaying together in this like very beautiful church-like unity, harmonious field that was like nothing I had ever seen before. And so I do actually believe that like, if we are going to change as a species, the more that we can come together and use our voices and use vibration and set intentions, you know, like you don't have to go through a sound healing certification to use your voice or to play a crystal bowl. Okay. One thing, um, you know, when I was really studying sound, um, there was a book by Jonathan Goldman where he talked about, you know, in the, you know, sort of the, the way that we've adopted sound healing in Western culture 
is more of, um, you know, like the, the chakra system. So it's like, it, it's, it's, you know, your seven chakras and working with those energy centers. And we've sort of adopted that from India. Now in Chinese, you know, um, their whole perspective around the energy centers are Dantians, which are not seven. So in different cultures, mm -hmm. they actually have different beliefs about like what kinds of energy centers we have, how energy moves through the body. There are different ideas about how that works. But why does sound work cross-culturally? When we're not doing, you know, we're not all doing the same thing, but, but still in all the science and research and studies that have happened, sound is being shown to heal no matter what kind of, you know, structure that you're using. And the reason is because in all of these different forms, they're using intention. That's the commonality. So if you sit down and you have a crystal bowl, a Tibetan bowl, a drum, a shruti box, a harmonium, a guitar, a piano, a gong, whatever, a, a didgeridoo, a flute, whatever possible tool or instrument of vibration that you have available to you, including your voice. Your voice is always available. And if you set the intention, when you sit down and you take some breaths and you set the intention, like I want to use this instrument, this vibration, you know, for whatever is in my highest good, to heal the places in my heart, you know, that are wounded or guarded, and through the vibration to just soften those places and whatever is available in this moment to just allow for those places to open, even just a little bit. And I'm going to use my voice. I'm going to use this flute. I'm going to play this crystal bowl. I'm going to play this drum. And I'm just going to completely intuit and listen and trust in whatever vibration comes through that will match and meet these intentions and know that it is in the highest good of myself and know that it is in the highest good of all. And then you just let yourself just do it. And you get out of your mind because there's no right or wrong way to do it. Even if you're like, ah, 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 and that's what you're hearing. Like, there's a reason. That would be me. That would be me. <laughs> no, seriously. Everything has intelligence. Like, there are sound yeah. healings where I actually will sing dissonant notes. Or my voice will like wiggle in a weird way that does not sound beautiful. And it's difficult for me because I want for everything to be harmonious and melodic and, you know, <clears throat> kind of perfect is like what my desire would be. But I've had to learn through years of being taught that every single thing has intelligence. Sometimes I accidentally, you know, hit the edge of my mallet on the crystal bowl and it makes a shrieking sound and it's like, the worst, it's like my nightmare. I absolutely hate doing that. But then I'll come, we'll come out of the sound healing session and the person will say that that moment had significance to them. It was like they were moving through something that was really difficult that they couldn't get out of. And then that noise broke something open and able, it was almost like it, like the dissonance kind of like shook up the energy, it opened it, and then it was able to fall back into resonance. So understanding that like if, especially if you're using your voice, which mine is so hoarse and dry right now, being here in Sedona at nine in the morning, get some, um, get some water, mm -hmm. <laughs> refresh it up, make sure you drink water and you, you know, like love on those vocal cords because you don't want to be hoarse like me, but it's really just trusting and it's being willing to just try, you know, and do it by yourself. And if you have an instrument, especially an instrument that... <clears throat> has more of like a drone kind of sound like a shruti box or um you know a crystal bowl or a tibetan bowl they're always going to be like one or two notes you know if you're playing two bowls or if you have two notes in the shruti box but it's always going to be steady so you can sort of begin to tune yourself like the instruments actually activate my voice i didn't sing the way that i sing now before having the crystal bowls. The crystal bowls actually, there's like a relationship that happens with instruments and the voice where if you're, if you're capable of listening into the subtleties and if you are willing to practice, 
if you play a single note crystal bowl and you just practice toning. Toning is just intuiting whatever you want to sing. And you can just start with, uh, you know, whatever whatever note wants to come through. I'm not going to try to sing right now. <laughs> it would be really funny. Um, but you just, like, set the intention for this crystal bowl to activate whatever is, you know, available in my throat chakra. And just being willing to just dance with, like, trying moving different places. And it's just, like, it's really just completely intuitive. There's no right or wrong way to do it whatsoever. And everybody is capable of using your voice. And if you don't want to use your voice, you know, as a healing instrument for other people, like at least be willing to try doing it for yourself, you know, because if you, if you sit down for five minutes, even 10 minutes, you set an intention and you maybe just, you just ohm for five minutes straight your energy field is going to shift for sure. So if you're in a moment of like stress or panic or anxiety or like overwhelm of like, oh my God, I do this all the time. Like there's so many things that I have to do. And like my brain is tracking so many different vectors of what I need to do with my life right now. And it feels like too much. Take a moment, sit down, set an intention, close your eyes, and just allow yourself to tone, set a timer for five minutes, and watch how much your state shifts. Because you're getting into a space where you're no longer in your thinking mind, you're in a deep space of listening, and you're in a deep space of surrender. And it might be kind of crunchy at first, because I mean, I know even for me, even though I've been a singer all my life, when I started singing, there's that voice, it's like, am I doing it right? Oh, this sounds like crap, you know, it's like there's all this noise that happens in here. But the more that you just practice, it's like going to the gym. The more that you just like work out those muscles, the more experience that you have, the more confident that you get. The more confident that you get, the greater capacity that you have to expand into something extraordinary. But the only way that you can actually do that is if you try, you know. And and I get, you know, I get there's lots of people like my husband, for instance, does not feel very musical. He's really good at chanting and he's really good at oming. He doesn't really feel like he can, you know, sing melodies. And I don't think he even really knows what a melody is, to be honest. However, there have been moments where he's just been willing to try. And I've been mind blown by the way that he could sing. And it's like the, the more that you can just kind of get out of the mind. And, and I, I think that's one really helpful thing. If you can get access to a crystal bowl in particular, with crystal bowls, they have such a loud frequency that it almost feels like you have this accompaniment of a friend or something that just feels really safe. And so it doesn't feel as scary to sing when you're singing just by yourself you hear everything. So it's like a little bit more vulnerable, but when you can sing with like, you know, when you can sing with a crystal bowl, when you can sing with a shruti box, which is just like that very like drone sounding kind of instrument, when you can sing with things like that, it, it sort of, it relaxes you a little bit because you feel like something's got your back. And for me, when I started to sing and do sound healing, um, that was actually what really helped me to open more was because I felt like, even if I mess up a little bit, the crystal bowl's got it. And I'm just going to keep trying and I'm just going to keep coming back and I'm going to keep experimenting and I'm going to just keep showing up. <laughs> that was a lot You're again. speaking to my soul right now, <laughs> Bailana, because it's beautiful how you articulated that of the importance of sound. And you know, even I look post the trip from Egypt and also even starting this podcast in itself, I listened to a, like one of my first episodes that I recorded like three years ago, mm. and my voice has changed 180 degrees. And might have been part, and I was still going through puberty when I started the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, I was I was 21. I was 21. I was good. But what you say about like the confidence and how when you really discipline yourself to do one thing. And really practice it and our words carry consciousness mm-hmm. and not even with just the tones but also in our daily life when we're speaking or talking to a friend or someone on the street that we just met or the person at the supermarket we're also imprinting that energetic field and commingling just as the crystal bowls that you mentioned in the beginning we're creating a resonance and harmony just with what we say just with the 
you know, impeccability of that language that we can use because, you know, we didn't just pull these words out of our asses and now we're speaking. It's like words have a deep suited, like deep rooted ancient um, past. And I wanted to ask you, you know, you had a very interesting trip in 2021 to Maui mm. and your grandfather was sharing a story of the Hawaiian, the, the, the story of the Hawaiian goddess, the Madame Pele. Mm -hmm. And you had a realization <laughs> that the goddess is not something that is outside of yourself, but that she was you in mm -hmm. many ways. And mm -hmm. I think now as we're going through this awakening of the feminine and, and the goddess rising again, how'd you come to that realization that the mm -hmm. goddess was within you and not something that was outside? Totally. So sort of my, sort of my perspective. And, and I think, I think the, I think the word goddess gets thrown around a lot. And I think there's like a beautiful, I think there's like a beautiful reclamation and understanding that like, there is nobody that is special or better, right? Like there are, there are like, I actually perceive like every single woman and man has the capacity to connect to their own sort of strand of the inner goddess or inner God that's within them, because we all, you know, can access polarity. It's not specific to the feminine. And also just because we are women, you know, it makes a little bit more sense to connect with divine feminine ascended masters, like in the Sophia code. Um, and so I actually, my perspective of the goddess is sort of twofold. So the goddess to me is actually these archetypes that exist in like the collective, right? So like in the Hindu pantheon, you know, the goddess Kali is the, you know, she's Kali is the destroyer. She is the destruction of the ego and like exactly that which is necessary to be destroyed so that you can open into the creation of who you are meant to be. <clears throat> and those cycles come throughout your life. It's not like you go through like one cycle of that. Like we are dying and being reborn constantly. So if you sort of can look at her, like she is an archetypal, cult, uh, like an archetypal energy that you can connect with through different cycles of your life. Like that is something that you can actually animate and embody and channel through you, whether that be through art, whether that be through your poetry, whether that be through, you know, your, your, the words that you speak, whether those are the initiations that you're going through. It's like each of these different strands, like if you kind of think of, you know, all of life as like a braid. Like all of those archetypes are different strands in the braid. So like for me right now, for instance, <clears throat> I would say that the sort of archetypes that I'm connecting with more recently for myself, you know, I went through this really, really massive Kali phase and Kali, Kali is like fire. Kali is fierce. There is no part of her. She is like absolutely fearless. It's like, you want to shoot your arrows at me and attack me. She just has this wild ferocity that's just like, ah, throw, like shoot those arrows at me and I'm going to eat them and I'm going to spit them back out at you as love. Like that, her energy is just this, like, it, it's so unbelievably fierce. And it's actually- Have you seen her in your medicine journeys? I have. Are She's actually- with her? Yes. Like my, my whole album I came out with a couple of years ago called Goddess Rise- was actually initiated by a very visceral experience I had of her animating through my body in an ayahuasca ceremony. And so I understood her from a very visceral perspective of like, oh, this is, you know, her energy is so fierce and fearless. It was the most, um, it was interesting. It was like the most powerful that I ever felt because it felt like, you know, if you were like, the black jaguar or a tiger, like you're the apex predator. Like there is nothing that could possibly approach you that you are not able to contend with and destroy is what it felt like. But the importance of her medicine is the destruction of what is necessary. So if you see depictions of her, she's holding the heads of men that are like bleeding out, you know, and she's standing on top of Shiva, who's just like, 
yes, I love you. All of your wildness and your, you know, crazy chaos and fierceness. Like I love you for the entirety of your wild and the full breadth. And that's what I think her medicine is so powerful for the feminine because it's awakening that part of us. That's not just this like passive repressed, nice girl to be accepted by everything. And it also doesn't mean that you just go out being reactive and like screaming and raging at people. Right. But you also learn how to be with like that aspect of yourself that, you know, may have sacred rage that may have like a lot of energy that needs to be expressed. It doesn't need to happen with other people, but she welcomes in like those places that need to be seen and brought to light. And then ultimately destroyed, transmuted so that you can create space for something new. And so when I went through my initiation with her, you know, and I would say like, oh, you know, and and in my opinion, Madame Pele, since you mentioned it, Madame Pele in Hawaiian mythology is the goddess of the volcano. And she is this like wild, you know, like the, the volcano is absolutely like volatile and destructive. She's also the most revered goddess in Hawaiian mythology because within days of the volcano, you know, destroying and incinerating everything, it gives birth to the richest new life. Like it's literally bringing like all of those nutrients and minerals and everything from the inside of the earth and bringing that to the surface so that new life can be born. And so in my opinion, Madame Pele is an earth emanation of the Kali archetype. You know, like they feel very connected because the whole theory, she's trying to destroy my back right now. She totally is very Kali. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> um yeah, that it feels like those, 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 what they represent is the own access that we have to those cycles of creation and destruction within us. And those always are going to come. And so my Kali initiation was really about having to contend with all the things that I had repressed in my life that I actually had a lot of sacred rage around the places that I had felt repressed, the places that I had felt violated, the places that I had felt silenced. And, you know, she really took me on this really, really deep initiation of facing off with those things, of using the tools that I needed to, to be able to transmute them. One of which was, you know, in a big way, using my body, using dance to animate a lot of those energies. And then ultimately to create something new. And so a lot of those old patterns of how, I used to relate to women, how I used to relate to men, how I used to relate to trust, how I used to relate to love. A lot of those things got destroyed during that time. And and Kali's medicine is not for the faint of heart, you know, and it's not, it's not an easy path. Like it's, it's very, very intensely confronting and it really, you know, it really helps you to evolve spiritually and in, you know, creating this spiritual re- resilience almost like any other initiation that I've been through, I would say with Kali. So she's not really a goddess that you call in. She comes to you when it's time. <laughs> so I wouldn't necessarily That's suggest, so interesting. I wouldn't necessarily suggest for people to go looking for her. Like she will come to you when it's time and it will be very, very apparent that it is time. So that would be my, um, my advice around Kali. Uh, and now back to what I was saying earlier, you know, the sort of the archetypes that I feel like I've moved into since that time, you know, went through the fire, went through the fierce, went through the willing to take up all the space and for my voice to be loud and heard and to be audacious and all these things. And then since that really big expansion, destruction and creation, I softened into this place where I connect a lot more with Kuan Yin these days. And Kuan Yin is all about compassion, you know, Karuna compassion, which is for self, like, and then the way that you have like the deepest compassion for yourself and this like very soft, tender, like gentle kind of relationship to self that then gets to be translated to everything externally as well. And so I even feel like the way my voice has shifted, has shifted into this much more um, tender you know, like really raw and soft, but just as powerful kind of place where it's like, I don't need to be all big and, you know, have that kind of fierce energy. It's like, 
I'm a lot more subtle and I've softened, but the power is still as fierce and piercing. It's just in a totally different form. And then another archetype that I would say, you know, that I'm really connecting with these days as well is like, you know, very Aphrodite, you know, it's, 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 it's very like sensuality, the lover, you know, I'm, I'm co-authoring a book on pleasure with my teacher, Mark Gaffney. And I've been through, um, Mama Gina who wrote this book called Pussy, Pussy, a reclamation. Um, I did her pleasure co coaching certification last year. And so I'm very in like the sensual embodied, you know, coming back to like really, really owning my body and my sensuality and my pleasure from this new place. And so you know, connecting to the inner God or the inner goddess within you, understanding that these are archetypes or like themes that throughout time, these are the best way that we can encompass these particular energies that animate through us. And it, you know, it's helpful if in, in, in my opinion and in my experience, it's helpful to <clears throat> envision them act as an actual being because you know, I create altars and I love having the manifestation of that being visually on my altar that I am connecting with, that I'm praying to, that I'm making offers to, that I'm doing, you know, rituals around my cat is, to she's like fully trying to destroy my clothes right now. I'm like, talk about Kali. She's like, yeah, Kali. She's crazy. <laughs> just, just maximum. Ka I Kali's channeling through the cat right now. She's channeling through the cat. I, sh I, I probably could have called her Kali, but also don't name your pets Kali because that's like, you, if, you, if they really dangerous. animate us, Kali, it's dangerous. Yeah, some, I had a friend that named their animal Kali and I was like, oh my God, that cat's that, that. They named their, their, their kid Kali. <laughs> It was a dog and that dog destroyed everything. I was like, that's not probably the name you want to call it, but it's beautiful. Um, <laughs> so understanding that these, okay, um, so, so back to envisioning them as like a being. For me personally, I believe that it's sort of multidimensional. Like on one dimension, I believe that, you know, like having the visual representation of these archetypes or of these gods or of these goddesses like having that visual representation is like bringing them into the manifest so that you can focus your attention and intention on them so i think it's really helpful and simultaneously are they an actual being maybe maybe not they're they're definitely an archetype that exists and have played out throughout time in many cultures across the world and you can see sort of like these like crossovers of like, you know, the Hindu pantheon, the one, the thing that I love about the Hindu pantheon of gods of, and goddesses, they don't shy away from darkness, right? Mm. Like a lot of gods and goddesses, like they're the light aspects of human and they're, you know, they're the, the beauty and then they're the sound and, you know, they're the power and all of that. And I love in the Hindu pantheon um, that they actually have like, you know, Durga and Shiva, the destroyer. And it's you know, like those archetypes also exist. Like we're not just light and love and rainbows and sunshine, you know, like we have roots that go down deep into the earth. And we also have to face off with our own aspects of our darkness and our shadow. And so that's one thing that I really love about people who are just interested in this kind of stuff. You know, there's a book called um, Awakening to Shakti, um, by Sally Kempton. And uh, it, it talks about a lot of the different um, Hindu goddesses that, you know, is a really, really special book. She, was, she also has a book called Awakening to Kali um, that talks about her own initiation where she would advise in that book, like you don't go looking for Kali, but if you want to read about her and just be more educated, you totally can. Um, huh. But, you know, sort of like wrapping this up in a bow, if you feel particularly called and resonant to something, like if you're in a crystal shop and you see something about Isis and you notice a shift in your body or your heart, or there's this curiosity or this interest or some kind of allurement to a particular god or goddess, or even the image of one, if that speaks something to you, you know, I would advise like, there are lots of people who connect with Isis and there are lots of people who connect with Mother Mary and Mary Magdalene. And there are lots of, you know, people that may connect to Zeus or, you know, like there's so many different gods and goddesses. Um, 
you really can start Spider-Man. Any, sp- totally. Spider-Man is an Thor. Archetype. Totally, yeah, <laughs> totally. Um, but it's really about like, like what is the prayer of how you want to be in a relationship with these archetypes? And then what does that look like when you allow yourself to be in relationship to them and like how that moves through you? And a lot of the time, you know, for me, like goddess rise was my connection to Kali. It was the musical manifestation of the initiation that I went through with her to be of highest service to the feminine at a time where the women's revolution in Iran was happening. Like the timing of it was insane. Um, So, you know, allowing for those connections to not only be, you know, what you pray to, but also how you allow for those energies to animate through you in life, through your art, whatever that art may be. Like it can be, art can be painting, art can be poetry, art can be, you know, like, making a rock stack, like whatever, whatever your muse is, whatever your art of the way that you like to express art can even be through food. Like maybe you have Aphrodite on your ritual and like you make a prayer to her and then you make a dinner for people and watch how that energy like totally shifts from like a regular dinner you could possibly create, you know, like a very aphrodisiac dinner. Totally. <laughs> have you like had oysters, one of those? <laughs> oysters everywhere. <laughs> Chocolate, wine, <laughs> maca. <laughs> totally. It's like very Dionysian. Dionysian. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, in the beginning, what I said is like, nobody is special. What I would say is like there, there are some people who have people who have a greater capacity of listening and connecting and devotion. It doesn't mean that they're, it doesn't mean that, oh, like that person is just more tapped in than me or, you know, they're special because they can channel this or that or whatever. Like everybody has access to connect to the divine through your intention, through your prayer, through your body and through your listening and through your devotion. So there has to be like a willingness and a desire to connect, you know, allowing for that listening and desire to guide you to, you know, maybe you read the Sophia code because, you know, you can get completely introduced and intimately connected to Hathor, Isis, Mother Mary, Mary Magdalene, green, uh, uh, what is green, green Tara. Sorry. I have a white Tara statue here. Green Tara. Um, uh, oh my gosh. White Buffalo, white Buffalo woman. And then, um, yeah. and, Kuan Yin, sorry, <laughs> I'm trying to go. Kuan the main Yin, one, the MVP. The Kuan, Kuan Yin, and then the Sophia Dragon. So, like, you go, you go through these intimate, like, initiations with understanding their story as they walked on this planet, allowing for that to inspire you, just in and of itself. Like, story is actually what moves culture, and then you go through this like beautiful ritual activation of like allowing for things to, you know, encode in your own vibratory field whatever their essence was as they walked this planet. And then you can feel from there, like, where do you feel the most resonant? Like for me, when I read that book, it was Hathor. And then very soon after I was taking the sound healing certification and getting totally initiated with sound in this really beautiful way. So, you know, it's like really listening, feeling into it, and then just like taking the action on beginning the relation, the relationship and knowing that like, this is available to everyone. It is completely democratized. There is no person that you have to go through to connect to the divine with your intention and your prayer. Like you have direct access. And the key word there is connect, not worship the divine mm-hmm. or worship these goddesses. Yeah, and, and that's the thing too with like, um, it's the only thing that can be a little bit tough about having an idol is I think where things can get a little bit squirrely, and this is just my personal opinion. So I have no, I have no judgment about, you know, cultures that they are actually in worship of these gods and goddesses, because that's so much a part of like, I look at spirituality as like a tree, like the roots and the the roots and the trunk of the tree is God. And then all the branches and leaves and everything are different emanations of how people connect to God and whatever somebody's path is, is it's like to each their own. And I have so much deep honor and respect and non-judgment for 
whatever's people path is to connect to the divine. In my personal practice, um, I perceive everything as God and I believe, and, and I believe that this is a big reason why sound comes through me in the way that it does is I believe that we have access to connecting to the divine as a direct experience. So I do believe that you can connect directly to these gods and goddesses directly through your being, through your body, through your listening, through your sound, you know, and I don't make in my personal practice, I don't make them separate from myself. You know, I do, and it's almost it's kind of nuanced and it's multidimensional. Like, yes, on one level, I do have them on my altar, you know, to really connect with their energy because that manifestation of them on my altar is really helpful for me to really connect and to pray. Um, while say, simultaneously, like, I believe that in the field of existence and vibration and being in collective consciousness, like we have access to all of those different strands. So I don't really believe it as other than me. So there's multiple dimensions of it. Like on one level, like it's an archetype and it exists in the collective. So it's like part of the sea. Then there's another, then there's another um, aspect where I can feel like my own personal connection to them in the greater field. But there's almost like, it's almost kind of like an avatar you know, when they make the connection with the animal and it's like Sahelu, like I believe that there's mm -hmm. that as well. And then I also believe that sometimes too, like when you're working with a particular archetype, like you could set a space and put on some music and allow for them to animate through you. Like my whole Goddess Rise album was a prayer to Kali. And the prayer was, I will be the vessel. I will be the conduit of whatever message that you feel the world is needing most right now, like for the feminine that is healing, for the feminine that is repressed, for the feminine that is being violated. Like I, I, I surrender my voice to be the conduit of whatever you want to channel through me. And so, yes, it was me and I was the right vibration because of everything that I've been through in life, because of the process that I was going through, because of my own vibration and field that I had, you know, become over my life and all of my spiritual work that I had done. And yet it was also something that was beyond me. I was connecting to something that was me and, and transcended me. It was, it was a mm -hmm. prayer for the collective feminine and in connection to the archetype of Kali to come through me in her particular prism of how she can activate the feminine. So it's like, I don't know if that made fully, I don't know if that fully made sense, but it's like, there's so many different dimensions of it. But I think when, you know, and again, no judgment, like when there's only this worship as like, you know, you are what's holy God or goddess. And I'm just here as this like, you know, small human that isn't even worthy of connecting with you in that way. Like, I think that's where it can get a little, where it can get a little bit off in the idea of worship. She's destroying my foot now. <laughs> crazy girl um kali <laughs> kali but yeah so i i i resonate and i i understand where that where where the worship thing was coming from because i think when we are separating ourselves from the divine it almost like limits our capacity to be like, like the altar be the house of where the divine can animate through you um and so that's just my perspective of how i like to relate to those kinds of energies and when you're channeling Kali through this album and, and even through your daily life, what is that specific message that Kali really wants humanity to understand and grasp onto right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, her, her medicine is a lot about confronting the shadow. So the shadow, it's funny when people talk about shadow work because the shadow is actually what you can't see right? <laughs> so it's actually hard to do shadow work because you can't actually see it until a moment or a ceremony or a reflection from somebody you trust. Like there's some moment where light gets shined on the shadow and you sort of go through the initiation of having to really face off with aspects of yourself that need to die and be reborn, that need to really like, like the energy of the patterns of self-protection, self-preservation, mistrust in life, 
mistrust in the masculine, mistrust in the feminine, and all that rigidity around like, oh, well, I was hurt when I was young by my mother, and so I don't trust the feminine. And I don't trust that I will be nurtured by the feminine. You know, I, I don't trust that I can ever have relationships that aren't abusive or, you know, it's like all these programs that we like sort of ingrain in the patterning of the way that we operate. And those programs and those patterns get really, really rigid. So at some point when your soul is ready to evolve and expand into greater light and into actually the soul essence of like what you came here to do right? Like there is an actual purpose of why you're here on earth. There is a, a completely and entire, entirely unique purpose that every single person on this planet has to serve. And part of why we're here is to remember what that is. And when we get stuck in the conditioning of the way that we were raised and all of our past traumas and all of the dysfunctional relationships that we've had, and we just get in this rigidity of being so closed off to life that we like can't even possibly listen, Kali will come and shake the shit out of you <laughs> to help you remember you were here for something more. You are not here to be a prisoner of your own stories. You are not here to be a prisoner of the, the, the trauma and the suffering that you've been through. It's not that you don't acknowledge and have compassion and be with those places in yourself. But there's also a part of your life where just like the, the caterpillar goes into the cocoon and gets completely annihilated and turns into goo, everything that the caterpillar knows about itself, like its whole identity as a caterpillar. I'm a caterpillar. All of a sudden I'm spinning this cocoon and now I'm getting melted into goo and everything that I know is dying all of it. And then slowly these disparate cells start finding each other and they start forming something new, but it requires the destruction process to happen. And if you are so stuck and so rigid about staying the same, life is going to get harder because you came here with a mission. You came here with a purpose to serve and your soul is not going to allow you to just like wiggle out of it. I mean, you can, and you can stay asleep. And for some people, that's the path that they choose. And then, you know, by the time they die and transcend back into their soul, then they look back and be like, wow, I really miss the mission that I went to do, you know, that I went there for. And so <clears throat> being in the cocoon, it's uncomfortable. It is not a pleasurable experience getting melted in your whole identity of yourself and the way that, you know, you're perceived by the world and the way you perceive yourself and all of the, who you thought you were supposed to be is being destroyed by life, which typically happens when you go through your Saturn return and then multiple cycles. You know, I just went through another Saturn cycle last year and it was as intense as my Saturn return. So knowing that that is a part of the process, but those cells, those disparate cells eventually start finding each other and they start to create something new. And it's like, oh, okay, well, there's this new creation that is happening. And I'm so curious. It doesn't mean the destruction is not still happening, but there's that, there's those moments of like being in the, the mystery and the void of like, I have no idea who I am anymore. And I have no idea who I'm meant to become. And it's like, if you can just envision the caterpillar in those moments, that's exactly the process that nature is showing us like a cycle of life. And eventually the butterfly starts to form and it's, it's super vulnerable. The butterfly has never flown. And actually to be able to even fly and leave the cocoon, it has to bump up against the sides of it and build resistance and build strength. So even when you're forming into this new rebirthed form, it's still going, there's still going to be resistance that's going to strengthen you into actually bursting out of the cocoon and taking flight for the first time as a greater representation and a greater expression of your truest soul's essence. And these cycles are going to happen. It's not like a one time type of thing. It's going to happen multiple times throughout life. Like Saturn, so Saturn, Saturn is in a specific specific position when you're born and around like 28 to 30 ish in that range, it returns to the same place from when you were born. And so Saturn is like this 
the ultimate teacher and it does not bring the easiest lessons and those cycles breaks down go, all structures totally and it does and and it's exactly what's happening with the caterpillar and the cocoon it's like it's breaking down everything so you are melted into goo so that you don't even know who you are anymore and some people take that seriously and some people like really make the choice to wake up and to really observe the way that they're living their life so that they can choose to do something different. And some people have the desire to just really stay the same and life just gets more difficult because it's like the more that you're off path from your soul's mission of the unique, beautiful service that you came to do on this planet, the more that you go off path, the more challenges you're going to run into. Car accidents, broken, you know, broken bones, deaths in the family, like the things that are just, you can't possibly ignore, that they shake your life up so much that you just can't even pop, you, like you can't go back to the way that you were. That happened for me when my grandmother died. Like I was pretty much atheist. I mild, I believed in something more, but I was very resistant to religion because I didn't like when I was little how they told me what I needed to believe. I was like, no, you don't get to tell me that. And so when I got older and it was my choice, I was just like, I didn't go to church. I didn't do anything. But then my grandma died within days of my birthday. And I realized it shook me so awake because I was like, where did she go? Like, I don't believe in heaven and hell personally. This is just my own, again, just asking for everyone's respect of my own way of connecting to the divine. Yeah. I believe heaven and hell is what we create here while we're alive personally. And where does she go when she died then? And why am, what is life for? And why am I here? And what is my purpose? I was just like, I started asking all these questions because her death was like such a rude awakening for me that I couldn't be asleep anymore. And her dying was what opened me into my entire spiritual path because I became a seeker of like, what is the meaning of life? And I've never stopped since then. So it's like, you can go off path but trust that life will, you know, present you the perfect opportunities, which may not be easy ones. It may be an illness. It could be cancer. It could be, you know, like something traumatizing that you're just like, but it's like the only thing that can actually get you to wake up and get you to notice and get you to, to decide to do something different and get you to begin to inquire on like, what is my purpose here? What is my like unique, like completely one of one unique purpose of what I came to do here on this planet? That like in the symphony of God, you are the only one that can sing that note. God can't do it without you. For everyone to understand that like everyone has different levels of responsibility and you know, like it, it's not like this unification of everyone singing the same note. Everyone has their own note. And if your note is missing because you're trying so hard to be somebody else, to be what your father wanted, to be what an influencer on Instagram is doing because they're famous and they have money, to try to sing like somebody else because you don't actually know your own voice. Like if you're trying so hard to be something that is other than yourself, you're not singing that note in the symphony of God. And God only wants that note. So if I could advise anything from this whole podcast, it's like fill yourself up with so much of you. Whatever it is that you do in life, discover more and more and more and more who you are in your truest essence, not what is modeled by everything around you. Like break free of all of those constructs of like, I should be this way because this is what is acceptable because this is what the world thinks is beautiful because this is what I saw Kim Kardashian do. So I've got to do that too. Like break down all of that noise and get quiet and listen and make the prayers to become like the truest essence of you because where the world is moving into and Honestly, from my perspective, and I think a lot of people who've been on a spiritual path would really attest to, is like your truest authenticity is the most beautiful thing. It is not about your image or your appearance or what the fuck you wear. All of those are just poetry and just additive, great, you know, cool things that don't actually really even matter. 
what matters it's just the is costume. that you it's just a costume. It's fun and you can play with it and it's super fun. You know I really love fashion. So it's super fun, but even if I had nothing, I'll wear a trash bag. And if I show up truly as myself in a trash bag, that is what's beautiful. It's not about all of the other stuff. And, you know, part of so much of what we've talked about on this podcast of being able to coming to come back into that remembering. You can do that with sound. You can do that with connecting to these different archetypes. Like you can do that with so many of the, you know, so many of the modalities and things that we've talked about on this podcast already. But, you know, I really, I really would just love, and I I imagine your audience is probably like a little bit like of a younger demographic. I'm 36. So (laughs) I feel like people, people who follow me and know me, you know, like they're, they're very in a, in a realm that. I'm in and, and, and probably pretty close to my age, but if I could have told myself anything when I was younger, one, your life is going to be so much more beautiful than you could possibly imagine. You have no idea all of the struggle that you are going through, all the pain that you feel in your heart, all the confusion around like how to be in in relationship with men and women in all the ways that you don't trust life, all of that is going to be the fuel that you are going to destroy because that destruction energy is going to be the fuel that is going to catapult you into the most glorious life that you could possibly imagine. And all of it is important. It is important for you to know so deeply the pains of humanity because of the way that you're meant to serve. That's number one that I would say. Your life is going to be so much more beautiful that you could possibly even imagine. And two, do everything you possibly can to stop trying to be like everybody else and actually find out who you are. Whatever that may look like. I took two and a half years of traveling the world mostly by myself to start that journey because Mm. there was so much of me who was just chameleoning myself into, well, oh, is this what you'll love me for? I'll be that. Is this what you'll love me for? I'll be that. I could do that. I can be great at this thing. I could really like sports if you like it. Just like, who do I have to be for you to love me? Until I got to the point where it was like, I have no idea who I am. And it was so painful to realize that at the point that I did. And simultaneously, the journey that I decided to go on from that place you know, and the years that it took me to just really find myself like that, that process was absolutely stunning. I would never change anything. But if I were, you know, closer to you in age, those are two really important things that I would have loved to have known. And to know that you are the creator of your experience If you're experiencing something in your life that you don't love, inquire within about why you are bringing this to your life's experience for what it's there to teach you. Because until you learn that lesson, you're going to continue attracting the same guy. He's going to have a different face, but he's going to have all the same things (laughs) that are really challenging. One with blue eyes, one with green eyes. They're going to be the same until you learn the lesson. Like One thing that was a really big lesson for me to learn was... You know, I had a lot of trauma in relationships, lying, cheating, betrayal with men, with women, like both, both sides, just so much betrayal. And in all of my 20s, I felt just so victim to like how painful life was. And that's an important part of the process. So don't bypass victimhood because it's part of it's part of one of the steps. However, at one point, I had this big realization that I'm the common denominator between each of these things, right? So what is that saying about me (laughs) that I continue magnetizing to my life these kinds of relationships? Like, what does that mean about me? And deeply inquiring about what that is. So like also understanding, like I always look at, if I am not loving something about my life, what is this trying to teach me about myself? Where do I need to have better boundaries? Where do I need to say no to the not, right relationships you know where do i need to actually claim what i act what i really want and feel like that's valid and that i'm worthy to experience what i really desire 
you know, those kinds of things. And then, and that's like part of the maturation process. But I think those three, I think leaving it with those three things is, is really amazing. Cause I think if I would have known those things when I was younger, uh, I could have saved myself from a lot of heartache, although I wouldn't change anything cause it's perfect. And the younger generations, you guys are just coming in with like so much more awareness and depth and you know like you're you're on like a skyrocket path compared to where I was when when you I was your age I was working in nightlife and doing bottle service and drunk all the time I was like a totally well the, well, the, of the whole life. consciousness is different all the sure. consciousness in the planet right now it's it's shifted radically it's true and um I feel like today you lit a fire in us, like Kali really br <laughs> brought her through. The cat was there channeling Kali as well. Oh, Vailana, this is such a beautiful soul. Um, you know, we end every show with just a few rapid fire questions before we head off. But first, I just wanted to leave people where they can find you. Your music is amazing. The new series is amazing. We'll link everything down below. But where would you want to send people to connect with you further. Totally. Yeah. So my, um, my Instagram is at Vailana. It's V Y L A N A. In my link in bio, you can pretty much find all the cool things that I'm doing. My website's on there. It has a link to all the podcasts that I've been on. It has a link to my, I am unique sound series, which is on YouTube. If you also just look for me on YouTube, it's just youtube.com slash Vailana. Um, and then my Spotify is Bailana as well. And there's a new track on there actually with um, my Goddess Rise album is on there. And there's a new track that just came out called Ritual Evocation with a brilliant, probably the, I think it's part of the greatest musical masterpiece of our time. This uh, gentleman's name is John Hopkins. And this particular album was very inspired by Egypt. And it's like, it feels like the essence of life. It's like death, rebirth, you know, it's not like a song that you would listen to with lyrics. It's like an experience that you'll get to tune into. So he just dropped the first single from the album and it's called Ritual Evocation. And so that's now on my Spotify wow. and you can listen to that. It's really special. And it's part, it's just like a little five, six minute snippet of a 41 minute long journey. And so once, yeah, once that comes out, I'll, I'll definitely send it to you. But um, it's a it's a really, really special track. He uses my voice like an instrument, but he really has just like built this. I mean, it feels like Kali. If you want to connect to Kali, listen to Ritual. It's like it's it's like a death rebirth portal that gets really uncomfortable and then ultimately has this beautiful resolve. And it's a really special part of that album. So, yeah. Instagram, Instagram, you could find everything. YouTube, I have all of my um, my I am unique and we are unique sound series, and then yeah, Spotify and any like major music platform. My my artist name is Vailana. Beautiful. And you were talking <laughs> about the caterpillar turning into a butterfly, and actually those cells. Um, doing a little bit of research on it, I realized that those cells are called the imaginal cells. Oh, imaginal those are the cell cells. Response. Yes. But I, I was going there because, you know, imaginal is very similar to imagination. And as mm -hmm. you reclaim your own goddess, as you reclaim yourself, I was wondering, and this last question is, where are you imagining or what is the what is the greatest outrageous desire that you are imagining into your life at this mm -hmm. moment? Mm hmm. Can I have two? <laughs> you can have a 10, 15, a thousand. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, yeah. My, my greatest desire is really, you know, um, creating this series. I am unique sound and just like the really extraordinary people that I get to work with. And, you know, an aspect of it is like a podcast, but also, you know, these people who have really mastered certain aspects of life or just have like such evolved spiritual codes, like you actually get to receive the vibration of these people to encode that in your own body and in your own energy field. And so I feel like this series, just reaching the people who are ready, you know, to really activate and, and be in the remembrance of their greatness and to encode themselves with these soul songs of epic humans who have so much to offer. You know, I, I really believe that 
in a big way, you know, this sort of wave of sound as a technology is this totally, you know, it's, it's a new expression that I haven't seen before. And so my deep desire is for, you know, this to reach as many people as possible because it's ultimately the whole purpose of it is for people to remember, for people to remember their greatness and for people to remember like what they came here for. The very first episode was with our sister Blue and it's called I Am Remembering. So in that transmission, not only do you get to receive her powerful prayer and, you know, like her being, but it actually is a transmission of you being in remembering of yourself, of your greatness, of your mastery, of your dharma. And so I really hope that, you know, I don't like putting numbers on things, but I would love for that to just be this explosive, like reaching people from all over the world to be able to, you know, encode and activate like these new vibrations so that we can evolve as a collective. Um, and then my other really, really massive vision is these visions I've been having for, oh my gosh, like six, seven years now of, you know, these massive activations with me and multiple other singers. I won't, I won't give too much into the vision because it's kind of already in play, but these big open air theaters, massive activations of the types of energy that we experienced in Egypt and sort of bringing that consciousness and that vibration to the masses of, you know, those thousands of people, here she is again, those thousands of people coming together and really like anchoring in a vibratory field, the more beautiful world that our hearts know is possible, that we can all live right now. And to allow that vibration of that more beautiful world that we are living in this beautiful field of harmony and resonance and unity that that then becomes a beacon and a possibility that sort of shock waves out into the collective that like more people begin begin to come online to these technologies of using our voices and sound she's so aggressive right now um <laughs> and then it just starts to wake 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 this technology up all over the planet like the world needs more sound healers if you feel even mildly a call to use your voice you know like I, I, this isn't any one person's dharma. This is the planet's dharma. And so we need these like pockets and these networks of people who are anchoring these codes in the collective so that, you know, maybe even within this lifetime, we get a glimpse of that more beautiful world that we are trying to create for our children and our children's children. And, um, and ultimately, you know, that my voice just be used for good that my voice is put to good use, that everything that I do be lined with love and received by those who are ready to receive it. And ultimately, I already feel so fulfilled in my life. And um, yeah, I, I also have the humility to know that the great weaving is also beyond what my mind can even imagine. So <laughs> <laughs> what would be the name of your soul song? <laughs> <laughs> the name of my soul song <sighs> so <laughs> this is a little edgy for me i'm curious what my husband would think about me sharing this but i i had a ceremony one of the things that we do as um, sort of a, a, a practice of remembering ourselves, uh, my husband and I in ceremony, is we claim our name. And so um, sort of like, have you ever seen, um, what is it called, Game of Thrones? Or like any of those I actually movies where they're like, yeah. so it, they'll, they'll be like, you know, so-and-so, first of his name, you know, breaker of chains, whatever. And they have this whole like list of their name when they introduce themselves into a space. Huh. So my husband and I do that. And we are, have just really been in a deep listening of what those different aspects of ourselves are. And something came, Nate Thierry, <laughs> something came through for both of us in a, a ceremony that we were in. And I would say as part of my name, my soul song is voice of the worlds of god wow wow that's powerful <laughs> voice, that's powerful voice, voice of the worlds of god <laughs> thank you for asking mic drop. 
<laughs> Alana, you lit a fire in this conversation 100%. And it's my biggest joy, my biggest pleasure of seeing you and, you know, getting to meet you was an angelic experience in and of itself and <laughs> continuing to weave together. Um, I'm always here for you and I love Same. what you're doing in the world. You have my full support. And Same. Just thank you for dropping all this wisdom today. You were you were on fire. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I've had it. I'm you have to do this again. <laughs> I know. Maybe I should do more early morning podcasts. I guess other than my throat being dry, it, it went it went okay. <laughs> oh Beautiful. well, I love you. I love you so much, and just bless you for sharing your voice with the world, and you know for connecting with so many people who want to lift your voice and you know and that love you and you know may your path forward just be ever expanding and same always here for you and and just celebrating you and cheering you on and, and always here as your sister and your ally and and uh your 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 fellow fashionista <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you so much. 